Support Wrestle Talk. Give us a subscribe. Hey. I heard there was a story on AEW Collision this week. Some people may not have stuck around to watch that story, but hey, it was a damn good one. And we're here to discuss. I'm Tempest, and that's the truth, Dan Layton, here on this, what did we say in the office? Smack Lision? Yeah. Collide Down? I think I heard Smack Vision and realized that that's not correct. Yeah. It's our SmackDown and Collision doubleheader podcast review here. Welcome, one and all. Hello, this is the Russell Talk podcast, and we're here to discuss these two shows from the last few days. Obviously. The weekend debrief. Yes, obviously we have gone through Elimination Chamber, yep. so a lot of SmackDown will have been, the questions will have been answered and such, but there are still mm. some things on that show I'm very excited to discuss. However, first we need to get into the main event angle from this episode of Collision. A very good episode of Collision, I thought, with plenty of good matches and some things that we'll probably discuss being less than good, but the best thing to me was what we saw in this main event. Now, we'll go over the match first and then have a broader discussion about how w uh, AEW has told this story and such. Because we had on this show Brian Danielson going one-on-one -on -one with Jun Akiyama. Mm -hmm. Now, Jun Akiyama's been on AEW programming before, back in 2022. Wrestled Eddie Kingston on the, I believe, Full Gear pre-show. It was a great little match, very emotional for Eddie Kingston. And they'd wrestled on Rampage the week uh, prior to that. But... We haven't seen them since then. So they did a very good job during this show of showing those clips from the Rampage tag match that they'd had in 2022. And then the follow-up to that, as well as Brian Danielson giving a backstage promo on this show, where he was asked, just like, oh, Brian Danielson, you're going to be going one-on-one -on -one with Jun Akiyama. And he's like, you should have said the legendary Jun Akiyama. Now I could come on here. And this was mostly a promo towards Eddie Kingston. Mm -hmm. Because he comes in and he says that Eddie Kingston's not a professional. He'll come in here and be like, oh, the boom mic and oh, look at your shoes and this and that. But why am I here? He's not a professional wrestler. And I'm not just mad because of Eddie Kingston's behavior. I'm mad because of his potential. And this is something we've heard time and time again from people saying that Eddie Kingston, you know, had the whole world at his disposal and then has only really come and seize the brass ring or whatever in the last year or so. CM Punk said this during his back and forth with him in 2021. And of course, Brian Danielson has come up very often as well. And this was the point of this promo. And as well as saying that he respects Jun Akiyama. And he doesn't respect Eddie Kingston because of all the things that I just mentioned. And he's going to go out there tonight and he's going to beat Jun Akiyama and he's going to be honored to share the ring with him. And this is all well and good. And then we get to the main event. And I once again must put over Eddie Kingston on commentary. He's very good at this. Mm -hmm. And we talked a few weeks ago about how Brian Danielson walking past Eddie Kingston and having the fun dynamic where it's not that he is just ignoring him, but he's doing it with like a, I know this is going to get under your skin, Eddie Kingston. It's been a little git about. Yeah. There's a fun dynamic at play between these two and the show-don't-tell way of the, the subtlety of I don't respect you. Mm. And this then played into the match because from the start, it very much seems like Brian Danielson is just going to respectfully wrestle Jun Akiyama, the unofficial fifth pillar of all Japan pro wrestling, the man in DDT pro wrestling now, one of the last real superstars in Japanese wrestling from the 90s that's still wrestling at a very high level. High level might be a bit of a stretch, but in this match, wrestling against Brian Danielson, he's wrestling at a very high level. He goes out there, and they have a very fun little match. You know, it was kind of similar to the Yuji Nagata match from a few weeks ago where Brian Danielson goes out there with somebody that this audience probably doesn't know super well. You know, it's one thing if... You know, the great Muda comes out in Madison Square Garden, a mm -hmm. WrestleMania weekend, everyone's going to pop and go nuts for all the big spots and such. But a Japanese legend coming into, I'm not sure where the, this show was, but... Springfield, Missouri. Springfield, Missouri. I listen. I know those parts. You just watched <laughs> the show. I watched the show yesterday. <laughs> but coming into this, probably not going to be the most well-known guy on the card by any means. But they did a very good job of showing why he should 
be respected. He went toe-to-toe with Brian Danielson, and they did a very good job of making it seem like a close match until the finish where Brian Danielson just gets up a psycho knee and beats him. And it was very, very solid main event. But the main event itself was not what I loved about it. What I loved about this was what happened afterwards Mm. and the angle here. Because again, this could be really over the top and everything, and it wasn't. It was nice, it was subtle, because Brian Danielson wants to show respect to Jun Akiyama. And he sticks out his hand and is waiting to to shake hands and have a, a mutual showing of respect. But in the middle of this, Brian Danielson turns to Eddie Kingston, who's been on commentary, and just gives him the bird, Mm. flips him off. And Jun Akiyama sees this, and Jun Akiyama and Eddie Kingston have formed a respectful relationship over the last couple of years, dating back to their match at Full Gear. And Jun Akiyama sees this, and he's like, whoa, hey, no, 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 that's not gonna fly here. You don't try and show respect to me and then disrespect my friend, this person that I share a lot of respect with. And Brian Dennis is like, oh, very sorry, very sorry, oh. Here, we, we shake hands, yeah? And then he kicks Jun Akiyama right in the dick. <laughs> and this, like, Eddie Kingston needed no provocation to get in the ring and start a fight, but this was more than enough. He gets in the ring, and they start having just this big old brawl, and it was fantastic stuff. Eventually, the rest of the Blackpool Combat Club comes out to try and make the save, just and FTR, yeah. and everybody, like, this, the, everybody involved in the FTR BCC stuff is fighting Hmm. and everything, and it sets up a big trios match for next week's Dynamite. So that's how we end Collision. And I thought the subtle nature of this respect story, which I'm so invested in anyway, Hmm. was really well done in this closing angle here. And I want to get your thoughts on it, because I think this also opens up a really interesting discussion about how AEW has been presenting some of this story. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what we've seen on Collision in the last few weeks and months anyway, with maybe some lesser known faces appearing on the show in high profile matches and how AEW builds them up. So what did you think of the match and the, the promo, the angle afterwards? I mean, I thought the match was great. Stop the press. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um, it, was, it was a really good match. It was a really good TV match. I am someone who doesn't have the extensive knowledge of Japanese wrestling that you do. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I am very Western-centric. I'm guilty of that. As a, I, I think probably, in all fairness, the vast majority of wrestling fans in North America are. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I am aware. I know some. I know what AJPW is. I know what DDT Pro. I know Noah. I know certain names better than others. The idea of the great Muta popping it up at, is, is a really um, prime example because that's something where I would be like, oh, sick, it's really cool that they're doing this. Or a magician like, uh, you know, right. I, I know um, some stuff from like the Wrestling Channel in the UK in 2004. Um, but so, so for me, this is very much a name, a person. Mm-hmm. But it all comes down to how you, as a promoter, tell me who that person is and tell me what that person is. We were at the Riot Cabaret show the other week. Incredible triple threat main event between Michael Oku, Robbie X, and Leon Slater, which ends with Oku, um, one of the worst fantasy booking judges in the history of the world, but an incredible (laughs) professional wrestler. I completely disagree. Strike that from the record. (laughs) Um, Cutting a promo for the next Riot Cabaret show. And I don't know the person who will be his opponent. People in the room did, right? So... But the, the method of the promo, the way he was putting over his opponent, the way the crowd who were aware of, is it Mark Andrews from mm-hmm. Subculture, reacted to that you know news and that prospect, said to me, oh, I'll make sure I'm at the next show kind of thing. And that's promotion 101. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what we got here throughout the episode, which was this person is a legend. The whole segment with um, Danielson, his his retirement announcement speech, or at least the winding down of his career speech, where he basically said, if I'm going out, I'm going out doing things I want to do. And if Brian Danielson, who I do know, whose career I have followed for years, says to me, I want to wrestle this guy, that is enough for me to go, well, this is going to be a, a thing that I want to watch. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So then we get that. We also then get all the added extra stuff because the real story here, the real narrative is not Danielson versus... Oh my God, June. Akiyama. Akiyama, thank you so much. What that was a mind uh, melt. Um, it's not Danielson Akiyama. The real story is Danielson Kingston, mm-hmm. and this is a uh, a a nice plot point 
in that story because not only is it cool that Danielson wants to wrestle this guy, it's also I'm doing this to get in your head, Eddie Kingston, specifically. Yes. I'm not I, I want to wrestle the guy. That sounds like fun, but also I get to sort of have a go at you through this and beat your hero, mm -hmm. you know. And then the whole business with Eddie Kingston on the commentary, absolutely doing a fantastic job. When you make me forget that Nigel McGuinness is there, you're doing <laughs> a brilliant job on commentary. Um and he was selling the whole thing as well. He was talking about how he cried in that match with, mm -hmm. with Akiyama. And it was just, and I kind of, and that's another thing that I can relate to as an audience member. I don't, oh my God, am I going to do this? Yes, fine, why not? Let's do an analogy with my, my other love, Broadway musicals. <laughs> um, I, wrestling is Broadway with body slams. I've always said this, but I'm someone who loves theater and old mm. theater and my my girlfriend is um also a musical lover but hasn't gone as deep into it as me and we went to see uh sondheim's old friends on my birthday and i got to see bernadette peters sing send in the clowns and i was incredibly emotional seeing a broadway legend sing that song mm -hmm. it really it was not just that it was one thing that i was seeing bernadette peters it was another thing that i was hearing that song it was the th it was the combination of all those things that made me feel just like oh how lucky am I to be experiencing this right that's what Eddie Kingston was selling me and ultimately mm -hmm. wrestling is about selling wrestling is about making us as audience members buy into what is being given to us and that's what this did it achieved all of it as far as I was concerned and then the post match angle furthered the story ahead of Revolution which I thought was brilliant I don't I don't see how you can look at this and see anything but an absolute success yeah. No, I completely agree. And going into this match, there were, honestly, probably a lot of bad faith takes about... No, in the wrestling no, industry? Right, that's crazy. It could <laughs> never happen. About there not being a story to these sort of matches being booked. But I'm going to speak to the people that I'm going to believe aren't doing it out of bad faith. Mm -hmm that are just looking at somebody that they are unaware of and go, why should I, why should I be interested mm. in this? Because I think there have been quite a lot of, you know, takes on the matter from ranging on the spectrum of good faith to bad faith. You know, you got Ice Cube's kid going on a podcast and just being like, oh, if I say I don't know this AEW person that's coming to the show, I get chastised for it. And everything. Yeah. You know, so there, there's a range here for sure. And even though my taste in the presentation of wrestling doesn't have to line up with you, the audiences, or anybody else's for that matter, because, you know, we've seen Brian Danielson go on to face uh, Hechicero mm -hmm. and, on a collision show and Yuji Nagata, and these things may be having a little bit less of a storyline reason for being than this match against Jun Akiyama. But I think the point more so of these things are just like, if you allow yourself to be open yeah. to new people and new things, I think you'll benefit a lot from that because it's not as if all of these things have been oh, just a cute little showcase for Brian Danielson, and then we move on, never think about it again. Because you look at Hechicero, and you look at what they were doing with the CMLL stuff and everything, and this, of course, leading to a, another match in Mexico City mm -hmm. and everything for CMLL. And there's a reason that match takes place. It may not be immediately apparent when they throw the graphic up, mm -hmm. and maybe some people are more used to the angle being set up well in advance and then the match being announced mm. and being built to, then everything kind of coming together at once, like that CMLL thing did, and just showing, hey, Brian Danielson's wrestling a luchador on Saturday, mm. and I don't know who that is. Whereas in this case, with AEW's presentation style, particularly with Danielson's matches as of late, it does benefit you to kind of sit back and listen to the show and just kind of let things happen because they will do everything in their power to let you know who this person is, mm. either through commentary or video packages or whatever they have access to. 
you will know who this person is by the end of the match. Mm. It's just whether you want to know that well in advance of sitting down to watch the match or not. And I'm not going to tell you that you're wrong for wanting to know yeah. both sides of this main event coin well ahead of time if you're going to dedicate your Saturday night to watching it or even buying tickets to go and see it at the show. I'm not going to say that you're wrong for that whatsoever. But I do think a little bit more patience with how this kind of thing is presented would go a long way for some of the fans that this might frustrate a little bit. It is interesting, the whole conversation, because I'm someone who I... we. <laughs> We've had many conversations on our Monday shows about builds. Mm -hmm. Luke and I used to disagree on this very much. Uh, I am someone who likes to get there, right? But I think it's looking at the idea of what is the there, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. And in this case, the there, the destination, is Danielson Kingston. Mm -hmm. And so this match is a stop on the road to cross my metaphors uh, to cross my companies towards that match right so so i don't need this one to have that level of build i just need what we got on the show yeah um on the other side of that i am also someone who feels that um it is sort of an aw trope to provide a heatless banger um mm -hmm. and to chuck a couple of guys in there and you tell me that they're really impressive and that they're you know whatever but i'll need to see it and then believe it if that makes sense and i don't love it i like things to i like to get excited for stuff mm -hmm. i like to to have my, my mouth water and the prospect of you know who who's this person going to face and like what, what's the reason for their story and what's that match going to look like um and and when you just sort of throw a match on tv and tell me it's great before with with no context i find it hard to really buy into it now with any form of entertainment there are um layers to that there's levels mm -hmm. to that there's there's um different strokes for different folks like different i i prefer a certain style of wrestling you prefer a certain style of wrestling neither of us are correct mm -hmm. right and that's one of the fun things about this show is actually i think on the smackdown side of the coin often it is WWE's trope to ram things down your throat to make sure that you've got the message to hammer it home at every given opportunity. And actually, I find that the the most effective way is somewhere in between mm -hmm. what is, or at least for a lot of last year, was AEW's way versus what is WWE's way. I think about All In and the lack of... I really did sense this lack of excitement. Was CM Punk always saying, like, why am I the only one who's mentioned that All In's coming up? And mm -hmm. I thought about that because there was an All In graphic on the stage during this match. Um... So I was just thinking about that aspect of this whole conversation, this, this lack of really pushing. There was some storylines, but it felt like a lot of it just sort of happened rather than the build to the bloodlust thing that I really want to feel. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting as well on this show to hear w the way they're talking about Revolution and specifically the way they're talking about Sting's last match. I'm inclined to buy Revolution because of how well they have made me want to see Sting's last, last match. Oh, yeah. I want to give them credit for that purpose. I am inclined to want to watch Revolution and sit. I'm not the biggest Eddie Kingston fan. I don't hate the guy, like, is is the joke on the show. But I'm not, like, you know, I, I like him. I don't, he's not the style that really sings to me. I want to watch Revolution to watch this match. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, there's a really interesting... Um, way of looking at this whole conversation with these two shows and with the varying different ways that you can do it. I also think when you're booking, you have like your main overarching story and then also all the little things that go into yes. it. And ultimately, if you're giving... So like I will take Serena Deeb in this show, for example, um, or Thunder Rosa, both of the women on this show who, who got wins as examples of people who are at some point, I would hope, in a title picture. Yes. This is the beginning of that story. So they've got to have these matches, which were varying degrees of squashes. One of them was more competitive than the other to build to that story. Did I need to know exactly who, I literally can't remember her name, who faced Thunder Rosa today. Did I need to? No, because it, that wasn't the point of the story that we were telling. Um, you also can give me Charlotte versus Asuka at SmackDown, and, and which is the one I went to. And I remember going to the O2 and being like, I'm so excited I get to see Charlotte versus Asuka. I completely forgot it was a telly match before mm -hmm. uh, uh, Money, Money in the Bank. Bank. So I wasn't going to get like the match that I was expecting with those two people, but I was excited. So that you can give me those big names and under-deliver as well, sure. if that makes sense. There's all of that going in.
Yeah, I think for me, this bit of the conversation this week was where I did kind of feel the need to just be like, let's just have a bit of a chat about it because I saw so many memes and people on Twitter, X, whatever, <laughs> on their X. X, just saying like, I saw one great, you know the SpongeBob meme where Mermaid, one. no, not that one. Oh. The one where uh, Man Ray is showing Patrick his ID or whatever, and it's like, this is your wallet. So this, th th that makes that means this. And he goes, yep, makes sense to me. Okay, so here you go. And they're like, no. Blah, 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 blah. And then he gets frustrated. Uh, bad explanation. <laughs> but the gist of it was, this is Jun Akiyama. Yeah. And so I'm so a, sorry. I just went on to find this meme. I'm so sorry to cut you off. I just went to find that meme, so I opened Safari on our you know, tablets. Um, someone's been looking at cream puffs recipes. And I don't know why, but honestly, I love that for them. I've got one in my book, which is no longer available. But I, you know, um, anyway, SpongeBob memes. SpongeBob as you memes, were. where somebody says, this is Jun Akiyama. Yep. And he's Eddie Kingston's hero. Yep. So Brian Danielson is going to try and beat Eddie Kingston's hero to get at Eddie Kingston. Yeah. Makes sense to me. So that's the story. Why is Brian Danielson wrestling this nobody on collision? Is the format of it. Right. And I saw a lot of people having this story explained to them and were just kind of, you know, hands over the ears reaction to it. And that, I think, is the bad, bad faith mm. section of this. But I think that AEW has done such a fantastic job with this episode of Collision's main event mm. angle and everything that when I saw that, I was like, let's have a little chat. Yeah. So but, but there's, there's an element of this being an outlier, though. I think that's that's yeah. where the I want it to be clear that I come at this from a good faith position. because yes. I like that. Like the show. Uh, there are parts where I don't like the show. It's also interesting that there are people I find there are people on both sides, of, especially on X and other social media sites are available. Um, the, and this has been a thing since the forum days, by the way, yeah. since way back when, where there's this almost idea of like. Don't criticize my thing, please. Mm -hmm. And like, and my, my friend used to. um my friend Jack is a massive fan of Spider-Man, right? He loves Spider-Man. It's his thing. You know, it's the most popular thing, whatever. But he loves Spider-Man. So we would go to the point where when we went to see Amazing Spider-Man at uni, he was web-slinging down the road. He was so excited. He was mm -hmm. fizzing for it. And I love that for him. Um, we went to see Amazing Spider-Man 2, which is widely regarded as an underwhelming film. Not, not a great film. It's like, fine. Mm. No? That's a generous fine. But a generous, okay, I thought you were about to have a go at me because you think it's amazing. No, no, but, no. It's not really that amazing Spider-Man 2. Right. There you go. Okay, fine. But when we when we left Spider-Man 2, Amazing Spider-Man 2, he was on air about how incredible it was. And uh, gradually over time, but like there's that grace period where like, okay, we we know as friends, we're not allowed to criticize it yet. Yeah. At some point we'll be able to, but right now we can't. Um and there was there's something about that too, I think, AEW fandom. And I and I understand it because for the longest time we didn't have something like AEW. There was all there was a lot of independent stuff, but in terms of a major promotion providing the alternative that we needed, that's why some people take um fair criticism of AEW and reject it. Mm -hmm. So I hope that it's clear when I criticize it, it comes from this because I do think they do have a heatless banger approach often. Just it's good enjoy it like eat your dinner kind of thing and often it is often the matches are good but for me i need something more than to really sink my teeth into to love it if mm -hmm. that makes sense again the other side of the coin is is wwe where on this episode of smackdown there was a, a lot of broadly fine wrestling with a lot of really interesting storyline angles i want to find the balance between those two for really if i'm producing a show that's what i want it to look like so yeah um it's it's an interesting conversation mm -hmm. and one that i hope that people can have with yes uh, positivity. I, I hope everybody <laughs> is able to keep a cool head in the comments down below but let us know what you thought of this main event the main event angle and the approach to aew and wwe storytelling on the whole so let us know in the comments down below make sure you've liked this video and subscribe to the wrestle talk podcast channel if you haven't already and with that we're going to get into the rest of our collision review because my goodness did we open with a banger mm. we opened with powerhouse hobbs versus sammy guevara and I'll be honest, I am like three times past the point where I'm ready for this Don Cows family Jericho stuff to be done. <laughs> I've been done with it mm. for a long time. 
So the idea that we're still kind of kicking the can around when it comes to that being the storyline that Powerhouse Hobbs is involved with. Feels like years ago they were at that Cheesecake Factory. Right. It? Like, Doesn't it just? Yeah. And soon enough it might be. <laughs> but thankfully, we do get matches like this every once in a while. Because this was a no DQ match, and it sure lived up to that. Mm. So these guys, of course, very different styles. We kind of saw like Sammy Guevara have a somewhat similar match with uh, Miro, where he won the TNT title for the first time. Obviously not no DQ, but the the big meaty man and mm. the small flippy flying guy going back and forth is, is a very fun template to mm. work with here. And there was loads of stuff to like in this match. Big, high-impact hardcore spots where Sammy Guevara sets up two tables on the outside and is trying to to put Powerhouse Hobbs through him, but he grabs him and hits a spine buster off of the mm. apron through two tables. It looked crisp. Everybody was sharing the video and going, oh my God, Sammy Guevara has been broken in half. He's broken his back. How will he ever recover from this? Fantastic stuff. And ultimately this continues on. Some of this stuff was like maybe a little bit of a step off, but they played into that where Sammy Guevara was really taking his time to do kind of like the, the step up off of the ring steps, jump onto Powerhouse Hobbs while he was selling on the dasher board. But he really took his time and that allowed Powerhouse Hobbs to, to counter that. And so even the things that I was like, hmm, not sure about that, it ended up playing into the match. Eventually Sam and Guevara, as you pointed out in the office, didn't get a chance to use the two tables that he had set up, but then went and set them up again yeah. on the outside, which leads you to believe that he had a game plan and that he was going to stick to the game plan, set up those tables, set up a big ass ladder in the middle of the ring and hit a picture perfect swanton bomb off that ladder through the tables, taking out powerhouse Hobbs. And then there was another table mm -hmm. set up in the ring. And ultimately this would be the one that, would cause the finish because Sammy looked like he was going to go for his shooting star press and put the uh, put Powerhouse Hobbs through that table. But Powerhouse Hobbs shoves the referee into the corner, dropping Sammy Guevara crotched on the top rope. And he gets up and hits a world's strongest slam off the top rope through the table for the one, two, three. If Sammy Guevara won this match, I was going to have a tirade on this show, but he didn't. And then Powerhouse Hobbs won. And I went, God damn, that was a good opener. What's fascinating to me, right? Okay, so I, yeah, I agree. It was great. It was a great match. Really enjoyed it. Lovely plunder, no DQ, all the whole extravaganza. Um, and, I'll, and I'll get into specifics of why I loved it because first I just want to dip in with it, lead with a criticism. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why this is the opener of a collision why and why this wasn't a revolution. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Because a match like this with this level of like brutality and this level of, it, 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 it feels like this should be your, feud finisher it feels like this should be a main event it feels like this should be a or, or a main event of a collision or a match at a pay-per-view um whether the story warrants that i don't i don't know but for me it was this thing of like the 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 incredible you know look of the whole thing i guess i guess it is the collision way hearing myself to have a match like this, I'm thinking of um, Andrade and Matthews in the ladder match for them for the match sure. was on an episode of Collision. Brody King and Mark yeah. Briscoe was yeah. recently. Uh, it's just one of those things where I'm like, why why they open it for this level of uh, the, and it wasn't just like a, a random hardcore match that we'd get in the Ashley area. It was like a proper. It was a, such a clever, well thought out piece of plotting. Mm -hmm. The the bit that I I did mention in the office and you've you've summed up there so well is whenever a wrestler sets up a table. I want to know why they want to use it because often in these kind of matches, you see a table just get set up and it's, it's Chekhov, you know, it's Chekhov's ta table. It's going to be used at some point. What were you going to use it for? Why did you set up two tables, Sammy Guevara? And then I got an answer to that question later on, which was that I set them up to do a swanton. It's just that when you passed spine, spine busted me through that, by the way, I forgot how much I love the move spine buster. I it's watched great. a combination of, um, Batista Spinebuster and someone else's. Arn Anderson. Thank you very I much. I saw the same one. Yeah, there it is. And I was like, oh, this is just such a good move. <laughs> like, I love it. It's so simple, but it's so effective. Um, and that was an effective one. So why were you going to use those? Oh, you were probably going to do a swanton off the top rope through those tables. That's why it was so close. And you realize that you're going to have to up the ante now. And you did. And not only did he do it, I always get a bit nervous because I've been a Jeff Hardy fan my whole life. And Jeff Hardy has a habit of not hitting those. He <laughs> hit it perfectly. <laughs> Um, I've never forgotten that WrestleMania 2000 Swanton. Oh my he god! He just goes tailbone first onto the ground. In back in the NWA UK Hammerlock days, when I was training with them, I tried that off the ring apron to the floor, 
and I over rotated and landed flat on my coccyx, and it was so excruciating. I was on a crash mat from something that was less tall than I am. Imagine that. Mm -hmm. That must hurt, man. Um, I think they said they had a witch doctor come in and look at it oh, afterwards. With these little, yeah, there was a whole business. Yeah, yeah I, I've seen the video. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he hit it really well. Then also the idea of like, we'll just pin him, just pin him. And he didn't. He, he decided to get one more show off moment, which is what allowed Hobbs to take advantage and get the win. Um, I thought it was a much better and smarter match than a ma an opener of Collision, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That sounds that might sound like nitpicking and criticism. I'm trying to give it more. I think it was it deserved better. No, I, I see what you're saying. Like, especially the big swanton off the ladder through the tables and everything. It looks like a spot they'll be replaying in the same effect that they've replayed Darby Allen's swan dive onto mm -hmm. Jeff Hardy and the tables and the ladders and the chairs and everything, or Sammy's big cutter on Cody Rhodes. Yeah. And each of those things are like, those are the main events of Dynamites and really big established matches. Yeah, the only, the only pushback on that one is that, like, I guess it's because they don't have pay-per-views as regularly. Mm -hmm. You can treat a big Dynamite or a big collision like that. It's just mm -hmm. there's a pay-per-view next week. Yeah. This weekend. But, but Dan... Meat madness. You got to have a big meaty man triple threat. What does that mean? I don't know. It's going to be doing? fun, though. It's yes, of course fun. it's going to be I fun. I don't know. But don't stop, stop telling me this is a serious wrestling show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to the meat madness Yeah, so am I. Let's, let's, it's mad. Tell us about what we're doing here. It is mad. But anywho, we then had a backstage promo uh, with the BCCs, Claudio Castagnoli and John Moxley. And I saw some very interesting analysis of all of this on Twitter because this FTR BCC feud has not had like a clear reason for being. Mm. You know, it's like John Moxley and Castagnoli says, oh, any tag team that wants to step up can get stepped on. And FTR are they the, the top guys in the tag division on collision, so they stepped up. But the story progression of why they're continuing to fight and the real, oh, why I want to beat your ass, they've taken two very different directions with mm. this. And we'll get to the other bit shortly. But the Blackpool Combat Club took a clashing eras approach to their promo here as their match for Revolution. It was made official where John Moxley said, we're going to Greensboro, Car Carolina, North Carolina, excuse me, North Kakalaki, mm. where... It's the home of the Midnight Express and the Rock and Roll Express and Tully and Arn and all these great tag teams of the past. And FTR is a throwback to them, but we're looking forward to the future. We're not focused on the past and such and such. It was a very well-delivered promo because these two guys are good talkers. But then later in the show, that's not what we got. And fu funny enough, the next match was then the prelude for that because we had FTR versus Shane Taylor promotions of Lee Moriarty and Shane Taylor himself. And this match was, it was, it was all right. I thought it was a little clunky in spots. Some of their things didn't come off quite as smooth as I maybe would have hoped. But all in all, these guys are all good workers. I like that Lee Moriarty is getting a chance to do more stuff that's not related to the firm, mm -hmm. you know, because my God, that looked like a death sentence for him for a while. Mm -hmm. And he was honestly... The one guy in all of that that I was most interested in seeing succeed. So even though he's not getting like a push or anything now, he's wrestling regularly, he's in mm -hmm. matches with good guys, and he's paired with Shane Taylor, who we have a lot of love for here on the podcast. And this again was good match. Ultimately, FTR ends up getting the win with a doomsday device, mm -hmm. not with the big rig, which Maybe he's going to play into their match at Revolution. Maybe not. Maybe it's just showing that they've got many different finishers at their disposal. But they then get on the mic afterwards, and they say that you want to talk about different styles, different eras. We don't give a crap about any of that. Mm. What this is about for us is that John Moxley, you've been here since almost day one. He really has been there since day one, since their first show. He didn't sign on January 4th or 5th or whatever it was that the company launched. Double but nothing. he was there at their first show. He's been there since the, since the very beginning. And since then, it has been your kingdom, Mox. You've been world champion. You've run this place. This is your house. And you have surrounded yourself with the Blackpool Combat Club. And when you walk into a room, everybody's heads go down. Everybody's scared to look at your eyes and everything. But we're not scared. We're happy to walk right up to you and punch you in the mouth. And that's what it's going to be at Revolution. Because we're top guys, top guys out, etc. 
that's good stuff. You're the king and we're coming for your head. I like that presentation more than what the Blackpool Combat Club set mm. up because I think what they did maybe allows for the revolution match to have a bit more structure mm -hmm. in the, oh, maybe FTR will do callbacks to the Midnight Express and mm. this and that. And then the BCC will do something that isn't that, and mm. they can counter each other that way. But in terms of the story to make me want to see the match, I prefer FTR's manner of speaking much more. Yeah. I mean, I, I just like the idea of like FTR have lost titles and been on a very streak and they need to they're going to answer the challenge and prove that they are top guys it's very simple yeah. stuff for me and then and, uh, oh no i'm gonna get to watch that match this is one of the ones where it's like this is the actually a prime example of an argument for like knowing who they are because if mm -hmm. you know who they are you can put them together with very simple storyline and it makes me like if you can just put those two people do those four people together and i'm gonna go yeah i'll buy that like yeah it's it's FTR and it's BCC. Like, oh, how fabulous. I know these people. I have a vested interest in all of these people from their history with, you know, not just this company, but previous companies as well. And I, and I want to see it. And then lending back to what the FTR does so well, the the history, you know, all of mm -hmm. us leaning on that. It's just a, it's just a mouthwatering prospect, isn't it? Yeah. I like it. I was very concerned when this match got announced for Dynamite mm. a week ago and everything, because I was like, but I want to watch that on the pay-per-view. Mm. And then, of course, we got what we got. Now we're getting into the pay-per-view, and I'm like, oh, yay. Yeah. Double the presents. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> I appreciate it. So that's all very exciting. Next up, we had Thunder Rosa having her match with Lady Bird Monroe. Thank you. You're welcome. It's okay. I didn't catch it live either. Yeah. And this was a very short match. This was Thunder Rosa getting a squash in effectively, continuing her ascent mm -hmm. on collision here. And after after the match, she gets right in the face of the camera mm -hmm. and basically just like cuts an off the cuff promo, says, you know, I'm still on top. This is my division. I'm coming for it. Always been on top, etc. And then she gets in the middle of the ring and maybe she's just raising a fist you know, in celebration. But she does this. And boy, does that ever look like the La Faccion and Gobernable pose. Well, that's something that is fun either way. Yes. Because I don't, I didn't clock that. Mm -hmm. You did, right? Yeah. So it might be. It also might not be. Might not be. And there's something fun in that. It's very much like we were talking about last week where it's just the, ooh. Oh, this business, yeah. Yeah, this business or the point at Roman It's always Reigns. about this. this is, yeah. you know, maybe they're all just trying to do sign language. Yeah, well, maybe. There's only so many different poses you can do in wrestling yeah. these days. But Thunder Rosa in LFI, I like that. I, I think that's pretty cool. It was just a good squash as well. Like, it's one of those yeah. things where it's like, this was a very effective squash match. Also, um... I don't know. I can't. I, I always struggle to remember the history of what went down with Thunder Rosa, but it feels like yeah. she got a bit of a rough ride there. Um, and I like the fact that they're not, or, or she at the very least is not letting us forget. I was on top, and I'm gonna get there again. Like the yeah. idea of like, 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 don't, don't just write me off. You yeah. Know? So it was good for her. Yeah. Backstage, we had Renee Paquette in an interview with Chris Statlander, Willow Nightingale, and Stokely Hathaway. And Stokely begins all of this and says that he doesn't appreciate the hostility shown by Julia Hart and Sky Blue. He says that he wrote an apology, uh, an apology to them on Twitter and deleted it five minutes later. But hey, that's enough. And he gets cut off by Statlander and Willow Nightingale before he can say a naughty word and says that if Sky's looking for a fight, she'll beat her ass. Simple as that. This storyline just kind of has been chugging along and kind of ready for a, a four-way for the TBS mm. title, maybe, and then for something else, probably. But it's getting everybody involved. It's not much more complicated than that. Solid, solid enough. But my views on this particular interview segment, watch literally any collision review because it's the same every single time. I, I popped because they were stood to the other side Yeah. this time. Do something different. Yeah. This was For me, this was trash. This got right on my nerves. It, it's It's... Tricky because Julia Hart's been hurt. And yeah, but just be more creative then. I agree. Than just having them literally stand in the exact same format and cut the exact same promo every single week. There are other methods. Yeah. Well, Dan, the women's match segments are already taken up by a couple of people. Yeah. Also, I don't watch Rampage. So, like, you know, maybe they yes. are doing stuff on Rampage and I'm just not paying attention. But also, don't expect me to watch Rampage every week. Mix it up with all your shows, you know. Yeah. No, I agree. Uh, then... 
and then. I said earlier that I thought this was a good episode of Collision uh, with maybe some stuff on it that was less than good because we then had a trios match. A trios oh. match. Oh, this was a, an absolute mess. So it was this weird-ass mishmash of the Bang Bang Scissor Gang with Jay White, Daddy Ass, Billy Gunn, and Colton Gunn against the Iron Savages. Now, we'll get... We'll go through this sequentially because the Bang Bang Scissor Gang comes out and Max Caster, who I know you're not a fan of his raps and everything is a gimmick. No, in, I, in... I, I like the gimmick. Mm -hmm. I just don't like the substance. Sure. I, I actually find some of it quite offensive. Yeah. Honestly. I, I think, mean. I think he makes, l I, I'm here for joking about everything, but when you joke, you punch up, you don't punch down. And some of the other yeah. jokes that he makes. And also some of them are a little bit like. Uh, there was a, there was the situation. I don't know if you saw a Rhea Ripley interview where you know he made a joke about being cooked by a boy called Dominic or whatever. And sure. it's like, well, hang on, you're getting the other company over, not yourselves. And it, that's an, that's one where I'm like, okay, you're going for the all line rather than you know. But I like the gimmick. I like the team. I like his work. Like that's, I want to make that abundantly clear. Sure, but it's been no secret that his raps and everything have gotten him in trouble before, and as much as very recently on an indie show where it had people kind of fed up with this, this gimmick and everything. And then he comes out Again, and because of, of the substance. Yes. Like, because of the substance. Yeah. That, that's, and there's a diff I'm not offended by him getting over Dominic and Rhea to be, I, I don't know if I was clear in that. There's, there's some things that you say and some things that you just don't, don't do that. Don't be a twat. Sure. Sorry. I said an auto. Oh, it's, mm -hmm. it's quite all right. But in this case, he comes out, and he starts his his rap, and he says that I forget what he he was like facing the yeah. Iron Savages, like me against management. Yeah, and he gets zero response because sometimes these raps are too inside baseball for people, mm -hmm. you know. And then he just didn't he properly did an Eminem in Eight Mile or Papa Doc at the end of the movie, where he goes, "You guys must be seeing red." And he just had nothing left. Mm. And everyone just kind of went, uh, what? I went back and watched oh. it again. Like, he runs out of steam mm. and has nothing left. And I don't want to pile on the guy or anything because that's embarrassing. You don't want that to happen on live TV, mm. you know? And this is not something that I could ever hope to do. No. I am not a, I am not a rapper. But when you pair that, with this act and the match that they then had, yeah. I think I'm just about done with it all. Right. You know? And I was not really expecting the other half that doesn't include the ass boys in this act to be the bit that kind of has sapped my interest. Mm. But it really has. Well, this is a, a, a... It's such an interesting thing. The Max Hester thing, first of all, yeah... If you just choke, that's devastating. Like yeah. I've been, I've been on stage before in multiple capacities and completely forgotten a line or completely forgotten a, a, a note or whatever, and then just be like, where, where? There's nothing worse than being in the middle of a song because mm -hmm. you are running out of. You can't take your time to compose yourself on stage and make it look like a dramatic pause. You got bars. Yeah. They're coming in. There's no time. You just got to plow forward. It's hard. So I don't want to pile on the guy for that. I also was like, is this character stuff? Like, what's going on here? Is this, or is this just you? showing your homework like you're just being honest like mask off or whatever i don't know because he also looked later on when they're all doing their big celebration he looked completely gone so i i, I hope it's all right you know I don't, I don't know what's going on there it was a weird it was a weird moment to the point where i thought maybe it was character based um but then yeah the 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 match was was fascinating it was fascinating i think is a an interesting word to describe it because they face the iron savages who have been kind of the uh the job team for hire in yeah. the trios division on collision and we have seen since the start of collision that these guys will take a wacky approach to get themselves you know remembered by people i don't want to say get them over the, the, but, the Iron Savage is like rimming. This is the thing that they've done for the longest time. Yes, they keep to having honest, matches yeah. with, you know, ass-related content, <laughs> where <laughs> ass-based offense, if you will. 
where one of them, I don't remember which one it is, if it was Boulder or Bronson, I think it was Bronson, who in one of the early collision shows was just like, I'll get right up in it. Like that. And everyone went, what the hell? Like, okay. And you know what? For as difficult as it is to get some notoriety and such, because they were the bear country for years and years, Mm -hmm. never really went anywhere with it. They were just a fine team Mm -hmm. that would get beat on Rampage and such. If this is what you got to do just to get your name in the conversation a little bit, I'm not going to I'm not going to poo-poo that. However, when we then get this match against this Bang Bang Scissor Gang group that already is just a little bit too wacky mm. for my liking. And then we get things like the clip that was shared around Twitter all weekend where Billy Gunn hits a bad fame asser. Mhm. And then Buddy just gets up and in the school of Shawn Michaels overselling, does a f- complete f- like flip over the top rope, yeah. selling a move that is a face bump. Right. At this point, I'm just like, all of y'all can just piss off. Yeah. Like, at this point, like, I do not often get on a high horse when it comes to AEW and be like, this isn't my wrestling, like other people might. But this, this was the time where I was just like, why is this on a nationally televised wrestling show? Yeah. This is a, a house show goofball party match that you might see at an indie show. And it just, it not even did nothing for me. It detracted heavily from the show. I agree with that. I also think uh, when we're talking about the idea of the, the Bang Bang Gang and the Acclaimed and all that, whatever, I don't remember that what their full super trio's name is. The but Bang like, Bang Scissor Gang. Right, that one. Um, I just feel like it's a fundamental waste of all of them putting them together. I don't think any of them are really into it. I think I feel like what's Jay White doing there? Yeah. I feel like the guns are actually like I I I, I <laughs> you have feelings about the guns. I I think they're all right. I've mostly gotten over it, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe it's just because there were the people in this match that pissed me off the least. Yeah, well, I mean, this is it. And there's also, like, I like, and I do like the acclaimed. And as I said, I, I like the, the the rapping gimmick. I like the energy that they have. I really enjoyed when they won the trios at, um, at All In. I enjoyed being part of that crowd with them kind of thing. They had a nice little run there. And then it just feels like they just went, sod it. I don't, we don't have any strong. And even to the point where this little unit was put together like what four five six weeks ago and then very little has been done since yeah and, and this is the hazy mazy booking of aw where it's like maybe it's because there are so many maybe it's because it just depends what wind yeah. caught tony that day like i don't know um but yeah this was this was just a mess and that level of overselling is like what are you doing like yeah. what, what are you trying to achieve and we went to a show a few days ago where there was a, a naughty's themed Royal Rumble which had a Britney Christina stare down. We can have a laugh. We mm-hmm. can do... We can, we can, it has a place on a show like that, but this didn't have a place here. Yeah. It was just nonsense. Yeah. I think it has been one of the bigger, you know, uh, weak spots of AEW's programming for a long time, even dating back to, like, you know, the 2021 mm-hmm. golden era where if it's an undercard thing that probably isn't going to culminate on a pay-per-view, it'll just keep going. Mm. Whether it's Matt Hardy and Orange Cassidy or anything like that. Like, if it's a lower card feud, it'll just, you know, potter along. And I feel like that is what this double trio supergroup thing kind of is. Maybe because they couldn't have a big blow-off match with the devil and everything, Mm. who attack Jay White and everything because that was supposedly why they all got together Mm -hmm. and there's no end to any of that in sight because everybody else in the Undisputed Kingdom is busy and Adam Cole is hurt but this to me seemed like a surefire like oh here's a set of trios champs here's a set of trios champs we don't need both of them we'll have them like join forces for three weeks and then yeah uh, the Bang Bang Gang is going to turn on these guys and be like, why would you trust us? Obviously, stupid. And then they would unify the trios titles and only have one set of trios champs because two is just too many. And we're just dicking around. <laughs> that is it. They're you know? Around. And I'm not I'm not into it. Mm. And I, I, I was not into Billy Gunn and the acclaimed winning the trios titles at All In. That I understand is a personal thing where I just I don't care much for Billy Gunn and that story and mm. and whatnot, 
But like we waited around for a very long time for trios titles to be introduced because we got to wait till Kenny Omega's back and this mm. and that. And now it's just like, why do we even have them? And that is how I feel about them. You know, why do we even have them? And especially looking at where all the trios were like three years ago or so with Team Taz over here. And that was really cool. And you had the elite over here and you had like FTR and mm. people in the pinnacle that could have made a cool trio. And But I mean, you even have it here. Like we mentioned the Undisputed Kingdom. You could have the... You can have Taven Bennett and Strong. Like that's yeah. a trio. That's a, you know, and if Jay White can't have a go at Adam Cole because he's still injured, but you have to make that reveal happen at World's End in order to facilitate, you know, MJF going off and having a rest, we'll pick up that thread by having Yeah. You know, that that there's your trios right yeah. there. In my ideal world, and I don't think the never open weight six man tag titles in New Japan have been like the smashing success over the last ten years or anything like that. But they have often just presented it as this is the top faction right now, mm. you know, even if like the trios title match is not going to main event this show mm. or whatever. It's just like, hey, here's the set of belts to signify who's on top mm. right now, you know, and that could literally just be uh, Brian Mox and Claudio or we, or Yuta in there when he's healthy or again, the Undisputed Kingdom, if they're supposed to be the top faction mm. or whatever the case may be, but they're just props mm -hmm. they're just like haha we can sell scissor belts right now mm. i'm not into it nah so we had backstage the interview with brian danielson we talked about earlier and then we had the singles return of malachi black <laughs> my lord he goes one-on-one -on -one with the bounty hunter brian keith who i absolutely adore love the man he's great he was my favorite independent wrestler until he got signed. And I'm very happy to see that he is getting now a you chance. Hate him. No, I hate him. <laughs> oh, you sell out. No, because he's coming for that bounty. This was an interesting match because it's often a bit of a struggle when you have the star in the match be the heel. Mm -hmm. And he's supposed to go like kind of maybe not 50 50, but 60 40 with someone who's lesser known but the baby face, mm -hmm. which is what this match was. Because the people in the crowd are going to be chanting, let's go, Malachi, or just Malachi, Malachi. Mm. And therefore, it's a little bit harder for the baby face in the match to get the shine and necessitate a big comeback and get people into it. But by the end of the match, they were chanting, this is awesome. Mm -hmm. It did feel maybe a little bit like. This is what we do at this point. Yeah, kick out. And they both did a sit-up at the same time, akin to Undertaker and Brock at that mm. SummerSlam. They didn't laugh at each other, but it was fun. And they did some cool stuff. Brian Keith hit a tornado, D a tornado DDT out of the corner at one point. And it was, it was a good little match. And then Malachi Black won with the Black Mass. And then the lights went out. Mm -hmm. Roll reversal on him. And Mark Briscoe was stood in the ring with a kendo stick. And the rest of the House of Black came down. And he started beating, e beating each of them up. But eventually gets taken out by Malachi Black. And he, he it was because Mark Briscoe had the spike that was driven into his head. Went to go and attack Malachi Black with it. Missed. Stuck it in the turnbuckle pad. Got kicked. And then they all beat him down and left. So, saw a little stuff. Yeah. Not quite sure who Mark Briscoe is going to get for backup in all of this. Mm. You would think FTR, but that feels done, and they've mm -hmm. moved on from that. So it'll be interesting to see, nonetheless. Yeah, I have no notes on that. I, 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 you've summed it up perfectly. I think it was good altogether. I, I did enjoy the, the post-match. But yeah, FTR are done with House of Black, and yeah. going bringing them back into the picture would feel like a, 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 a backward step for all involved. Yeah. So whom? We will see. We will wait and see. We then had Serena D versus Lady Frost. And this was a more back and forth match than the earlier squash was on this show. But this still was very much the Serena Deeb showcase. Mm -hmm. They got a good amount of time here. Not a super long match, but enough to show that both of them are players. Lady Frost still looked very good. Uh, she hit Serena Deeb with the Chiller Driller, <laughs> which is a fun name for it a is. finish. But Deeb kicks out at two. Deeb hit a spinning heel kick. Or, pardon me, she ducked a skit. Uh, blah, let me take that again. Serena Deeb ducked a spinning heel kick. Deeb clocked 
Frost with a clothesline and one with a single leg crab. Interesting because it's very close to her finish, the Serenity Lock, which is the Tequila Sunrise, the one arm trap mm. uh, single leg crab, but nonetheless got the win and then afterwards cut basically the same promo that she has been, that the AEW women's division is heating up, that she's back to put the wrestling back in all elite wrestling and that in Deeb's dojo, which was kind of the new thing, she has a big flag she waved around and it was on her Tron and everything. When you step into the dojo, you know, you're going to get your lights turned out. It was good stuff. Yeah. Solid. Like you said, it does feel like both Serena Deeb and Thunder Rosa are kind of ascending the women's roster at the same time. Mm. Whether that will lead to championship matches for either or both of them, we will wait and see. I said before and I say again, I would very much like to see Serena Deeb, TBS champion, with a fun open challenge type thing. Yeah, uh, be, on that collision. Would, that's that's the direction to go, I think. I also, you know, I... I... I've given them stick a lot for the women's division, and and I I just like seeing the progression of it. It's yeah. it's you know it's baby steps, it's incremental, but it's happening, and I appreciate it. And I think that um, you know, going forward, it would be really nice to have some more feuds, some more things to sink their teeth into that aren't title related, that aren't just about climbing the ranks and getting to the top, and just having a little bit here and there, and and you know. So, but like, but thanks. You you look at one of my favorite uh, women's feuds they've had in AEW with Serena Deeb and Hikaru Shida. Mm. Just a straight feud of like, you beat me and then beat me up after. I didn't like that. Yeah. So we're going to wrestle again and have the best women's matches every single week. Mm. Love more of that. And big miss, big business is coming just a few weeks from now. And I think it is very telling that a lot of the members of the AEW women's division are all starting to heat up. At the mm. same time, they're giving wins to Thunder Rosa. They're giving wins to Serena Deeb. Tony Storm is still obviously a very big deal. Deanna Perrazzo is getting her title match. Mm -hmm. but you're getting Mariah May getting wins as well. All of a sudden, there's just a lot of people that could be in the mix when a new top star comes through the door. Don't get ahead of yourself there. No, of course. But that was Collision. So... On the whole, I thought a good show book ended with the best parts of it, which seems to be the collision template. Yeah. <laughs> but a good show. One that I don't know how many people would have seen because they might have been having a nap after their el <laughs> yeah. elimination chamber watch along. Hey, if you're having a nap in the PM, <laughs> that's not a nap. That's just bedtime. Yeah. Like. <laughs> well, that's fair. An early bedtime for some, but a show that I enjoyed very, very much because after that, we did get the Brian Danielson Junakiyama yeah. main event. So we are going to now switch gears over to SmackDown, which is a show that feels a little bit inconsequential now well, because Elimination Chamber's already happened. Yeah. But there were still some very good things on this show. It, it does and it doesn't because I, I was curious how we were going to sort of do this when we had an Elimination Chamber and often SmackDown, especially one when Elimination Chamber is in Perth. SmackDown was recorded last week. So, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's very much... Uh, uh, it, it felt like it could be a massively inconsequential show. But there are things throughout this where I'm like, well, this is interesting. And, oh, I like that. And, you know, I was going to just rattle through it. But actually, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that we can have a natter about. We, we kicked off with a, a match between Liv Morgan and Tiffany Stratton, which was a perfectly good match. And in the end, Tiffany slaps Bianca and steals the win after using Bianca's distraction. That then fed into the Elimination Chamber where Tiffany Stratton was one of the standout stars of that match. Mm -hmm. um, how are you feeling about Tiffany Stratton in the main roster at this point, a few weeks in? I'm a big fan. Yeah. Honestly, like when I saw this, when I saw this was going to be our opening match, Liv Morgan and Tiffany Stratton, I just went, oh, man, are they going to beat Tiffany and mm. like just kind of make her another one of the gals and whatever? And then the answer was no, mm. that she's the one that is getting the wins in these Elimination Chamber preview matches. And I'm a fan, mm. you know? I watched NXT 2.0 when she showed up for the first time and was like, okay, another trainee. And since then, she has improved greatly. Mm. I don't think that is news to anybody by this point, but she fits. Mm. She fits the main event picture here. Yeah. And I don't know what the plan's going to be for her at WrestleMania, but she's very quickly carving out a spot for herself. Well, I I kind of had... There was... there was uh, The contrast with Naomi, for instance, is something quite interesting. I saw um, a, a tweet... It was Michael Hamlet was tweeting that basically Naomi's been sort of they've they've missed the boat with her already like like they they've not done anything with her since the Royal Rumble and I can kind of completely see that argument but my response to that was when I watched the match at the Elimination Chamber and Tiff gets the pin over Naomi it was Tiffany pinning Naomi wasn't it I believe so there was something about 
those two have had a parallel sort of moment because after the rumble, Naomi obviously signs her contract and all the girls are really happy to see her and it's all like fun and vibes. And then out comes Tiffany Stratton and is the one who says, hello, me too. I've also signed a contract. And then since then has kind of had a little, a little rise and was the one to eliminate Naomi. And if you could maybe have a little feud between the pair of them being like, you know, stepping on each other's toes or whatever, both of them are incredibly athletic. That could be a really fun little first feud for Tiffany on the main roster that could go back and forth for a little while. Um, and again, a feud that's not related to a title. Mm-hmm. I'd be into that. Uh, so may- maybe that with Tiffany. I don't know. But it was nice to see her, you know, hit the ground running, I yeah. think, on her main-, main roster debut. Which is not something we see as often as we should. Yeah. You know, it's a lot just, hey, they're here now. And yeah. Let's ramp them up over time. It's like, no, this is a new star and mm. you should care. Yeah, well, like we, which we'll see later on as well. Uh, we cut backstage to Drew McIntyre, who says he's uh, saying, he says every moment has led to this. And if this doesn't go well, his career is as useless as CM Punk's return to the WWE. What an awful troll that man is. He is my favorite thing going in wwe today this is not even the best thing he does on the show nope uh because uh bobby lashley comes in and says everything drew's doing at the moment is so funny he loves the shirt he loves it all he's it's almost as funny as when he beat him at mania 37 which i'm gonna be honest with you wasn't a great line from bobby lashley like i it wasn't funny when he i don't know what i mean i was i was just like is that a burn bobby but okay i guess you're, you're doing a little bit of spice for the i liked chamber. it i i thought this all came off pretty natural for as much as these backstage segments can feel weirdly paced and staged it was just like drew was giving his interview and then he could sense someone behind him and Mm -hmm. he was like what and bobby just comes in laughing and he's just like yo man your stuff on twitter your shirt's got me dying bro that's so good oh it almost had me laughing like when i beat you at wrestlemania 37 uh and walked off Mm. and i was just like what a dick Right, this is great. So work for you in that way. Yeah. That's good. That's good. I'll take that one. Uh, how did this work for you? We went backstage. We didn't go backstage. We went to a video in, uh, I assume, either Cedric Alexander's house or Ashanti the Adonis's house. I'd They're hope. the new team, by the way. We we got that was a digital exclusive. I don't know if we saw it on SmackDown yeah. last week, but the new team is is Cedric and, and Adonis, which I like. I like both of their styles. I, mm-hmm. I think they I think they they fit together in that way. Um, in this uh, bit of reality TV insight. Cedric is trying on outfits and Adonis doesn't like any of them. Yeah. That's essentially the sum total of it. She just goes to show we've got different tastes because he kept coming out in all the different outfits and I was like, oh yeah. That oh, works. he looked great in all of them. Yeah. I was like, why are you so picky, Ashante? What, what's yeah. the problem with that one? Don't you be sitting there in your basic ass outfit complaining about yeah. these other basic ass outfits. This is unnecessary. Um, well, let's see where they go. What this- do you feel about these? Because we had Pretty Deadly last week with their reality TV segment. And Listen, now we have this, this is one. once again your shot of NXT 2.0. Yeah. And if I'm going to sit there and drink a bottle of tequila, I'm probably going to pass out. <laughs> but if I do one little shot, I'll, I'll take it. Right. You know? Yeah. I'll, I'll take it, and it doesn't bother me. It'll just be like, oh, boy, that was wacky. Yeah. But some people like that. I'm, I'm still on the fence yeah. about how I feel about the styling of it. Um, I, I, you know, if you're going to go floating invisible camera in the third wall the fourth wall and we'll, we'll have a segment later on where it's like do you watch your own television program or not mm-hmm. um if you're gonna do that you know uh, playing with it in this regard as well i mean they did it in lucha underground a whole load as well so it's like not well that was slightly different because yeah. lucha underground wasn't a wrestling show that was a show about wrestling this is well so obviously um, we're that's a whole other podcast. We don't have time because I agree. <laughs> um, we cut backstage to the bloodline and we had Jay recapping what's happened on Raw. You know, he's very excited about having taken Jay out again. Roman asks, who sent you to Raw? And Jimmy, uh, Jay has a moment. No, Jimmy has a moment. And he says, did I say Jay around? I got very confused. Whatever. Jimmy Uso is the one backstage having a nice time. Roman looks at Jimmy and says, who sent you to Raw? And Jimmy sort of hesitates for a second and says, Oh, it, it, well, it was Paul. It was Paul Heyman. And Roman says, oh, you're going to stooge on him like that. But then he sort of smiles. He's like, I made the call. You executed the plan perfectly. And Jimmy's like, oh, my God. I'm very happy about that. Um, which was just such a delightful, beautiful little moment. I have an awful lot to feel about this. Because then, obviously, Heyman sidles in and mentions that Grayson Waller's in town. Roman wants to see Grayson Waller. But there was so much in this where it was like that kind of, again, that kind of emotional manipulation element of Roman that fear that Jimmy has of Roman, all of that performance was actually absolutely delightful. And in any other circumstance, that would have been enough. Mm -hmm. But then I had a a moment to myself where I'm like, is he nervous about Rock making calls that he's not? 
Ooh, that's fun. Because obviously he made the call and he's exerting over the idea of like, did you just go to Raw? Like, you know, I, I, making J- Jimmy be mm-hmm. nervous to keep him in line. But is there a, a flavor in there where you could be, could be in to us as an audience member, just seeding the idea that maybe The Rock makes some calls and then you have a, who's actually in charge here? We had it with, you know, what does this mean? We mm-hmm. had it with um, Dwayne having a go at Paul and Roman just, yeah, and then carrying on. I don't know. I thought that was kind of an interesting little wrinkle, whether it's there or not. Again, kind of similar to the, the Thunder Rosa moment. Yeah, and I think that's a very good way of looking at it because we can look into this and create these, you know, different head cannons as much as we want. But at the base of it, Roman Reigns just manipulating Jimmy and just being like, who, who told you to do that? Oh, you're just going to tell me who told you to do that? Mm. I'm just like, God, this is why you were great. Yeah. This is why I sat here on every SmackDown going, oh, my God, he's the best character in wrestling. He's yeah. my favorite guy because it's so expertly done. Mm-hmm. It is so manipulative that you're sat there and go like, I wouldn't know what to do. Because mm. like, and, and there's no right answer. Like, what's the place I did it myself? Like, I was told to do it. I, oh, you were told to do it? Like, it yeah, it was, it was brilliantly performed, brilliantly it's executed. fantastic. It is. If, if Roman Reigns had just been on SmackDown, like, every other week for the last year, I bet no one's sick of it. I mean, hey, listen, they filmed this last week. Like, Batch record them! This is this is my point. Oh, if we've only got Roman for a day, rather than having just sit around and catering for a while, let's plan for next week. I there's so, so many segments on WWE programming, I feel, are done in the wrong place. There's mm-hmm. a lot of stuff done in ring that doesn't need to happen in ring. It was the on Raw, it was the women's uh stand in a line and promo each other segment. Sure. Which would have been so much more effective and so much quicker, by the way, time effective if it happened backstage in the locker room and then Nia Jax gets to run wild on them all. Do, do stuff like this. This is good stuff. And if you got him for a day, you might as well get two weeks worth of content out of him. Absolutely. This is like my favorite thing on the show. Bron Breaker then comes out to oh, have his... Never mind. De- oh, 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 oh. <laughs> his uh, debut match as an official member of the SmackDown roster, he faces Dante Chen in what was, very simply, a squash-a-palooza. Um, shows why Bron Breaker is who Bron Breaker is. Corey and Wade are, are really hyping him up on the commentary. There's not much to it. Just an awful lot of bashing, smashing a Steinliner and a, and a big old finish. This man is so beast. <laughs> this man is so awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I had one of my favorite Twitter interactions ever recently enough when they were doing the Dusty Tag Classic and I saw Braun absolutely run through Nathan Frazier and I just tweeted... The main roster is not ready for Braun Breaker. Mm. And somebody who, you know, is typically a, a, a good follower of mine just responded like, why? And I just sent the little video clip mm. of him spearing Nathan Frazier. And he just went, oh, oh shit. Mm, yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's, he's, he is this generation's Goldberg. Yes. Yeah. And for like, this has been the thing when it comes to WWE's top guys. For the longest time because they tried to make John Cena the rock mm-hmm. and they've tried to make Roman Reigns John Cena and therefore the rock and not everybody needs to be that because you look at all the different cases of the most successful top stars mm. in WWE history it's all the people that had nothing in common with the person that came before him mm. Steve Austin is not like either of Shawn Michaels or okay. Bret Hart who are not like Hulk Hogan who is not like Bob Backlund, Mm. who is not like Bruno. You don't need the next John Cena. Give me the next Goldberg. Because he's not been the top star of WWE for 20 years. It's just, it's leaning into his strengths, really. Because because Bron Breaker, you want Bron Breaker to be the best Bron Breaker. Because if Bron Breaker is the next Goldberg, then he... When are we going to get the next Brom Breaker in like 20 years time or whatever? So my, my thing is always like, oh, is Brom Breaker great on the mic? I don't know. But what he is great at is running the ropes and bashing people into into oblivion. Lean mm-hmm. into that. You know, and if Brom Breaker is great on the mic, even better. You get all of these things. It's like, I, I feel like finding what their strength is and letting them do that and letting that be the thing that makes us as audience members buy into them. Otherwise, what's the point of the performance center, right? Yeah. That's what it's there for, is to find that little nugget of gold, shine it up and send it up to the main roster. And I think, um, similar to Tiffany Stratton at the beginning of the show, this is him 
hitting the ground running at 23 miles an hour. Like he's, <laughs> uh, it's it's really just setting. And I also like the fact that we're using NXT talent in this way and, and giving them a name and letting us know that they're NXT talent because it does help with that whole. I always think about when they arrive on the main roster. Okay, well, don't you know go too much too soon. Let's take some time and work our way to get there so that when it is there, it's more satisfying. Well, if you're beginning them in NXT and having them be on SmackDown and see that they're rubbish. That is all part of the story. If you're pushing NXT as a brand you want people to watch, it's mm -hmm. a smart way of using the talent in that way. I thought this was really tremendously effective for a squash match. Yep. Yeah. Hey, I'm just excited to see Braun Breaker on SmackDown anyway. Mm -hmm. And this just reinforced that. It was. Uh, we had Judgment Day interviewed backstage um, ahead of uh, a match that was soon to take place. Poor and, Kayla. Uh, yep. She couldn't she, get her words out. No, it, it happens sometimes. It happens. But hey, it's, she powered through. Yeah. We're alive, pal. We're alive. But she got to the end of her sentence at the very least. It may have taken her several different ways to get there, but she got there. Um, and then we had the LWO backstage having a little natter. And then in comes Electra Lopez. Now, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this was the original Agarda del Fantasma. Yes. With Electra down in NXT. Yes. So Alexa's saying LWO is dead. Where's Rey Mysterio? What's he done for them lately? Janet Jackson reference. And maybe next time they'll uh, rethink their loyalty. That leads to Legada del Fantasma 2.0 coming in and roughing them up. And Santos says this is only the beginning. Um, oh God. Is yeah. this the bottom of the third for this feud? <laughs> this has been going on for a long time, guys. Yeah. And I'll be honest. I'm kind of done with it. Yeah, I mean, you know? I would imagine. I don't know what the status of Ray is at the moment. If yeah. he's if he's going to be cleared to compete, I would imagine a Ray Santos match at WrestleMania. That's um, always seemed like the direction. Yeah, but they just haven't really done much to hold my attention since then. It's similar to the acclaimed thing where it's just like, oh, we just put it in place and it just is. Yeah, you know, they're on a treadmill. They're not progressing. Where's the things. heat? Where's the the yeah. energy, the excitement? What Carly up to? Like, you know, there's all of that. Um, Carlito's entire return has been a peculiar one for me. He's Shelton Benjamin. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's like he's back, and everybody who remembers him from the time goes, Yay! And then has he won a match since? I don't like, know. He, I think he won his return match, mm. and that's probably been about it. Um, we then come back from commercial, and that is time for uh, the Judgment Day B team versus the New Catch Republic of Pete Dunne and Tyler Bate. Um, this got a whole chunk of time, mm -hmm. and uh, I thought it was very good. And I also thought the match at Chamber was outstanding. I really enjoyed myself very much. Um, so rather than talking about a match that was a prelude to the tag match at the Chamber, let's talk about the whole situation and maybe even the tag division going forward, because I'm almost more excited about what happens after WrestleMania. Mm. Because I would imagine we're getting an Awesome Truth title win at WrestleMania, which <laughs> it's going to be okay. And I also think it would be okay if the next... I mean, one of my things was the next... Uh, not the Raw after Mania, maybe the SmackDown after Mania. You know, Baron Corbin and Bron Breaker just run through and take some title belts for themselves and they have a little run with the tag belts on the main roster or maybe DIY or maybe New Catch Republic. I just think there are so many tag teams on the main roster and NXT that are of such quality and make me feel so excited watching their matches that I'm like, right, where are we going to go next? Mm -hmm. like, what's happening next? I think that's very fair. And in an, I, well, in my ideal world, I get some sort of either tag team title run or whatnot with the new cash Republic, because I think, you know, they're great, obviously. Yeah, and they work so well together. They do. And it's for that reason that I am hoping that the seemingly inevitable Pete Dunne heel turn where he turns on Tyler Bate and they have a, a little feud comes a little bit further down the line mm. because I do think them together might be better for their main roster tenure than they would as opponents, even though that will be fantastic and I would be very happy to see it. I do want them to be a tag team yeah. right now. But also this is something that I think is different to because obviously there weren't things like podcasts and there weren't things like recap shows and even forums and all that business way back when in the actually era you can almost imagine a sort of edge and christian and then the conversation being like very early on in their career like can't wait for one of them to turn and be the thing it's like i agree that's going to be a great program and it would be a great program but let's let's allow it to happen we we, we tend to all of us commenters and and you know podcast hosts alike get ahead of ourselves a little mm -hmm. bit so i'd love for a, a good long tag run from these two because both matches this one and the one at chamber just made me yeah. sing and this is the thing maybe they do like a four-way wrestlemania showcase mm. tag title match that the awesome truth wins maybe it's just a straight tag i'm not sure yet 
But the seemingly foregone conclusion that the awesome truth is going to win the tag titles at WrestleMania makes me think that a tag title reign for the new catch Republic is not in the immediate future. And just having watched WWE for so long where it's like, oh, well, they're not going to win the tag title. So let's split them up mm. has me a little bit nervous. But I do have to remind myself that that's a different regime and such and such and such yeah. and such. However, I really do like the idea of Baron Corbin comes up from NXT on the Raw after WrestleMania and he and Braun Breaker just beat the awesome truth for the tag titles mm. one day later. They just got such great chemistry. Yeah, yeah, and I didn't think I was going to say that about yeah. Baron Corbin led whatever in but this 2023, is it. You, 2024. If you're used improperly, and this is why Luke has always talked about Tyler Bay being held down on the, you know, he's just been stuck in developmental for like seven years or whatever. And that mm. is literally true. And and Luke, as someone who's a massive Brit Rest fan or whatever, is always like, what could he have been? What could he have done? Whatever. If he'd been called up in the McMahon era, the answer is nothing. Yeah, he'd and be like, curtain jerker on 205 Live. This is it. And, and so, you know, while I do also feel like maybe, in, I mean, I'm not speaking for Tyler Bate. I imagine Tyler Bate might be very happy with his money and house and whatever. I don't know. I don't know what those contracts are like. But this feels like a far more effective use of him than he ever would have got. I, feel, I do feel far more keen on his prospects. And I like... I, I feel like split the tag belts up personally. I'm gonna like, we have two shows, we might as well have two sets of belts. Um the judgment day I finish with them. I wouldn't have the awesome truth hold them very long. Um there's a lot that you can do. And there's a, that, that's why I'm excited about this division. They've been working hard to build this division over the past few months. And it's in a position now where I think you can sustain two sets of tag team, you know. We'll, we'll see. see. Um we go backstage again and we've got uh, Grayson Waller, Austin Theory, and Logan Paul, everyone's favorite trio of men that you want to go for a drink with at the bar backstage. Uh, they're having a little natter, and then Kevin Owen gets involved and seeds the little brass knuckles, saying he wants to be the one to knock Logan Paul out. Heyman sidles in and plucks Waller out to go and talk to Roman Reigns. Mm -hmm. uh, then we uh, we see Dakota Kai backstage being taken to medical. She's limping very heavily on her knee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But not before the Street Profits take on AOP uh, in a... Good match. It was fine. Yeah, it was fine. And the closing segment of which allowed uh, for Karrion Cross to come in and batter uh, Lashley's elbow, sort of put it around the post and hit it with a chair, which led into, obviously, a lot of what went down at the chamber. Um, they're very faction-heavy in WWE at the moment, and I mm -hmm. don't... I'm still yet to find a reason why the Final Testament exists. Mm -hmm. I know why... Um, the Street Profits and Lashley got together. I know why. I, I can tell why BFAB wanted to get involved with that, but it does feel to me at the moment that there is a, a massive, and it has been for a long time. Uh, let's find three men and a woman and plunk them together. Yeah. Every faction has to have the one woman, plunk them all together, job done. And I'm like, why are we? Why? Why so many factions? Why are you running together? Why is this? What's going on? And I haven't got that answer from Final Testament yet. Yeah, I think it would be very easy to have the answer be, well, you need backup if you're going to be the top guy in WWE because look at anybody that's tried to take on the bloodline or whatever, mm -hmm. but the bloodline's just not around enough yeah. for you to be able to tell that story. Like, and they, Well, they are telling that story with Cody. Like, they're, well, they're, yes. that's, that's the thing, is that, and that's... But that's that's why it's like that Cody has to put together his Avengers and yeah. they need to be the best Avengers of them all. That's why they have to be Seth Rollins. They have to be Kevin. They have to be all the top stars. The rest of the factions are just yeah. factions. That's it. Where if we were able to have Roman Reigns versus Bobby Lashley on a B pay per view, mm. maybe it makes a little bit more sense that he's recruited some backup. Mm. But we can't tell that story. So I agree. It does just kind of feel like factions look cool in a, on a poster mm. and such, maybe. Uh, I still I don't have that big of a problem with it, but I would no I, don't, I would tend to agree. Yeah, it's just a thing that I've noticed. And yeah, like, why, why are we doing this and why is it all so formulaic? Yeah. Um, then we get backstage, and this is the interesting section. We have Dakota Kai, who is in the doctor's room. The doctors and Nick Aldis are looking after her, seeing what's going on. In comes Bailey and is like, "Can we have a moment?" Dakota says, "Damage control jumped me in the locker room." Bailey apologizes profusely for not being there. She's frustrated. She's like, this has only happened because of me. And Dakota says, I don't blame you. I wouldn't have trusted me if I was in the same position as you. And, and I've let you down, she says to Bailey. Bailey says, they're not going to get away with this. And Dakota says, Bailey, I've got your back. And if you need me to, if I need to earn your trust back, then I will. She says they're going to make damage control pay. And she really emphasizes the word pay. Tempest, how do you pay for things with money? Where do you get money from? Banks. Sasha Banks confirmed. <laughs> um... Anyway, we're getting Dakota and Bailey against the Kabuki Warriors next week. Dakota Kai's in-ring return. She's finally clear. That's absolutely ecstatic to hear that. I, I love that for her. 
Um, but I have a bad feeling about this. If you're a I Bailey fan, would put dollars to donuts right now <laughs> that. Bailey's not making it out of this no. match unscathed. <laughs> and you know what is really effective about this? It hurts me. Mm-hmm. I don't want that to happen, but I feel like it's going to happen, and they've done a great job with that. This works for me as a fan. I'm genuinely nervous to see Dakota Kai turn on Bailey. Yeah. It will crush me. Because Dakota's been doing a really good job here. And and let's not forget it was a couple of weeks ago we had that amazing segment where they, you know, they talk to each other and then Dakota, is she going to hit Bailey with the chair? But then it looks like she's going to hit Io with the chair, and actually she played it so well that it could have been either. Mm-hmm. They've done such a good job with these segments that I'm, I'm, I've bought it completely. It's like they, they, it's exactly what I've said the last few weeks when it comes to this like week to week story. Is it going to happen this week? Is it going to happen this yeah. week? And then they show you it's like it's probably going to happen next <gasps> week, and we're all like, oh god, I can't watch. <laughs> It's going to be really exciting. And like that is the thing I'm most looking forward to on SmackDown next week, just to see how it plays out. Yeah. Ooh. And if and, and if it doesn't happen, I'm still going to be nervous. Like, I don't know what it is. It's, there's something they've done with all of this storytelling. And really, honestly, within the past sort of like four, five weeks even. Like, you mm-hmm. know, there was the there was all the stuff with Kyrie's return, but it still felt a little bit like, okay, we'll spin the wheels until we get to Mania season. But really in the past four to five months, they have let it sing. Mm-hmm. And I love it. I think they've done a fantastic job. Uh, good for Dakota Kai being back. Can't wait to see that, but I'm going to have to watch it through my fingers. Uh, we go back to the Bloodline backstage. Grayson Waller playing his role perfectly as like the year eight who's been asked to join the year 10 football team. He's mm-hmm. like looking around like he's a bit nervous. And then uh, Roman's like, this is for your ears only. And then we don't get to hear what he says. Mm-hmm. Um, you would imagine it would lean into the uh, Grayson Waller effect that happened at Elimination Chamber, but it sort of didn't. Yeah, nothing really happened no. in that. It was a good segment at the Chamber. The people seemed to really like it in the room. Sure. But like, you know. Tired of talk shows on pay-per-views. I, no, I, I listen, I agree. This is another one with the with the what do you want from your wrestling show thing? And for me, I want a less talk show and two more matches from, you know, WWE versus yeah. AEW's paper. Like Revolution, I almost, well, that match is finished. Now here's the next match. And I'm like, give me a second to breathe. Like I want, I want a moment of, of <laughs> respite. Um, so there's again, again, falling in the middle somewhere. But, you know, Grayson Waller did very well in that segment, I suppose. Yeah. We go to the medical room again. Busy night for the WWE doctors because Bobby Lashley's in there with his hurty elbow. And then in comes Drew McIntyre, who very simply comes over and he looks and he says, I'll pray for you, and then leaves. This man is the best. (laughs) He is the best. Yeah. I didn't think we would see a Drew McIntyre that would top, like, pandemic champion Drew McIntyre carrying the flag for Mm. WWE when they needed it the most, being a great champion. Or even pre-Rumble 2020, where he was really heating up, like, you know. But as a character, yeah. this man has never been better. Mm. He is like the most entertaining thing in the WWE that is there every week. And the way he he ultimately won the chamber, still playing into all of that, the idea that he he sort of toyed with Randy Orton a little bit too much, allowed himself to get suckered in, and then took advantage of the one lucky punch with the with the nooks is all adding to it. All I, God, I'm ecstatic for Drew McIntyre in this role. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and then we got our main event, which was LA Knight versus Drew McIntyre. And there's really not much to report about this match. It just sort of was. And I think we all knew when uh, Logan Paul and Kevin Owens came out to do commentary that we were just waiting for one of them to, to get involved, or both indeed, as is what subsequently happened. Kevin Owens is the one who caused the disqualification by, you know, taking the bait. Um, he's a hothead, after all. And then they had a, sort of a big fight. They hit moves on each other. Bobby Lashley came out as well. So they're all, they're all you know, hitting the moves. Drew hits a Claymore on Lashley to stand tall. And then what I loved was there was a ripple of noise from the crowd, yep. which let you know that someone's on their way. And of course, it was Randy Orton who hits the RKO to stand tall at the end of the show and lead into the chamber where, of course, Drew McIntyre won. Now, what was interesting to me about this match, you did have LA Knight getting in the face of logan paul and a question has sort of been well what happens with logan paul, well, logan paul and his belt because is the kevin owens story finished is la knight going to be involved because they kind of teased a lot of that way back in the summer mm-hmm. where are we going with that be- and then at elimination chamber logan paul knocked out randy orton and caused him the loss there's an awful lot you could do here yeah 
I'll be honest, I was not expecting Randy Orton to be in the conversation of like, oh, we'll do a seven-man ladder match at yeah. WrestleMania for the U.S. title, because everyone else kind of falls and fits mm. into that category. Having AJ and LA Knight be part of that, having Kevin Owens and Logan Paul be part of that, I'm with that. Mm. All that makes sense to me. Randy Orton, I'm like, hmm. Which that's curious led me to go. Is it going to just simply be Randy Orton versus Logan Paul? Maybe because the other option to all this is certainly just that we get like three mid card matches at WrestleMania. (laughs) And personally, I would prefer a ladder match Yeah, because I I think that saves a lot of time and Mm. is a much more efficient use of everybody's time and energy. But it'll be very interesting now that we're past Elimination Chamber and we can start to see how these things start to come together. Yeah, I think that's what I'm most excited for. I'm, I, we're now at the stop. The final stop is finished. We're on the road. We're going to find out where the, the chips are going to fall. It's about 40 odd days or so until yeah. WrestleMania. Um, I thought it was a, an absolutely fine episode of SmackDown for what it was was trying to do. Two, again, outstanding backstage segments between Roman Reigns and Bailey and Dakota um, that were really the kind of talking points of the show. Yeah. Honestly, they did a lot more with this episode of SmackDown than they tend to do where the crew's flying over and Mm -hmm. we tape a double episode Mm -hmm. because usually it means that both of those episodes, the live one and the taped one, get uh, not as much to do Mm -hmm. because most guys aren't going to wrestle twice and et cetera. But we still got a lot of matches. Mm -hmm. I thought the go-off-the-show angle was a good setup for Elimination Chamber. It's... You know, per- fairly cliche where you just have everybody brawl and then mm. somebody stands tall, etc. But it worked for me. All the people involved are big stars. And, you know, you still got little storyline threads with Bailey and Roman throughout the yeah. show to keep me interested. So a thumbs up to both shows this I week. Agree. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still going to give it to Collision, though. Yeah, I, I, I like that opener more than anything yeah. on SmackDown. I think that's fair. I think it was a, it was a more um, dynamic show. Mm-hmm. Um Whereas SmackDown was one where it's like, don't worry about catching the show, but do check out those two backstage segments. Yeah. I think that's how I'd review it. They'll be the most viewed things on YouTube, yeah. probably. Yeah. But the the collision had greater highs and greater lows. Yes. Because I didn't hate anything on no, SmackDown I like that. I hated that trios match. Very insightful. But let us know what you think of both of these shows, Collision and SmackDown, in the comments down below. Let us know what you thought was the better show of the two, Tribalism Yay. (laughs) Let us know and make sure that you check out the Raw podcast here tomorrow on the uh, channel with yourself, Dan Layton, and of course, Luke Owen, D-A-D. It'll be a fun show because we are on the road to WrestleMania indeed. I want to find out what is going to be on the show. We, We like to do that sometimes. Well, I will continue this sign-off plug just a little while longer. Yeah, just keep going. I'm going to be streaming on Twitch later today, so make sure you check that out. I'm on Twitch, Tempest Likes Wrestling. I'm going to be playing some Spyro 2. Make sure that you come and hang out, because it's a good time. We can hang out, ask me about Elimination Chamber, all the things, WWE, AEW, etc. Let us know what you want to hear me talk about. We've so. got uh, the New Day battling Imperium in a street fight. I uh, forgot about that. And also we have Sami Zayn and Shinsuke Nakamura on Raw tomorrow. So uh, I guess it's going to be very much setting the table elsewhere because there's a lot of hours left. <laughs> I reckon Drew McIntyre will talk. Oh, and probably so will Cody Rhodes. And, and maybe Seth Rollins. Jey Uso is going to have something to say, you'd assume. Um, maybe we'll start to see where Gunther's going to go. The, the, it, basically, it's a what happens next. I guess tune in to find out episode. Tune in to find out what you might see at WrestleMania indeed, and tune in to the Raw podcast review tomorrow with Dan and Luke. I've been Tempest, that's been Dan, that was SmackDown, and Collision. We'll figure out a way to put those names together sometime. Jam that jam. Jam.